Analytical Chemistry 2.0 by David Harvey. Chapter 4. Evaluating Analytical Data. When using an analytical method, we make three separate evaluations of experimental error. First, before beginning an analysis, we evaluate potential sources of errors to ensure that they will not adversely affect our results. Second, during the analysis, we monitor our measurements to ensure that errors remain acceptable. Finally, at the end of the analysis, we evaluate the quality of the measurements and results, comparing them to our original design criteria. This chapter provides an introduction to sources of error, to evaluating errors in analytical measurements, and to the statistical analysis of data. Section 4a. Characterizing measurements and results. Let us begin by choosing a simple quantitative problem requiring a single measurement. What is the mass of a penny? As you consider this question, you probably recognize that it is too broad. Are we interested in the mass of a United States penny, or of a Canadian penny, or is the difference relevant? Because a penny as composition and size may differ from country to country, let us limit our problem to pennies from the United States. There are other concerns we might consider. For example, the United States Mint currently produces pennies at two locations, figure 4.1. Because it seems unlikely that a penny as mass depends upon where it is minted, we will ignore this concern. Another concern is whether the mass of a newly minted penny is different from the mass of a circulating penny. Because the answer this time is not obvious, let us narrow our question to What is the mass of a circulating United States penny? A good way to begin our analysis is to examine some preliminary data. Table 4.1 shows masses for 7 pennies from my change jar. In examining this data, it is immediately apparent that our question does not have a simple answer. That is, we cannot use the mass of a single penny to draw a specific conclusion about the mass of any other penny. Although we might conclude that all pennies weigh at least 3 grams, we can, however, characterize this data by reporting the spread of individual measurements around the central value. Section 4A.1 Measures of Central Tendency one way to characterize the data in Table 4.1 is to assume that the masses are randomly scattered around the central value that provides the best estimate of a penny as expected, or true mass. There are two common ways to estimate central tendency, the mean and the median. Mean. The mean, x bar, is the numerical average for a data set. We calculate the mean by dividing the sum of the individual values by the size of the data set. The mean is equal to the sum of x sub i divided by n, where x sub i is the ith measurement and n is the size of the data set. The mean is the most common estimator of central tendency. It is not a robust estimator, however, because an extreme value, one much larger or much smaller than the remainder of the data, strongly influences the mean s value. For example, if we mistakenly record the third penny s mass as 31.07 grams instead of 3.107 grams, the mean changes from 3.117 to 7.112 grams. Median. The median, x tilde, is the middle value when we order our data from the smallest to the largest value. When the data set includes an odd number of entries, the median is the middle value for an even number of entries. The median is the average of the n half and the n half plus 1 values, where n is the size of the data set. As shown by examples 4.1 and 4.2, the mean and the median provide similar estimates of central tendency when all measurements are comparable in magnitude. The median, however, provides a more robust estimate of central tendency because it is less sensitive to measurements with extreme values. For example, introducing the transcription error discussed earlier for the mean changes the median S value from 3.107 to 3.112 grams. Section 4A.2 Measures of Spread If the mean or median provides an estimate of a penny as expected mass, then the spread of individual measurements provides an estimate of the difference in mass among pennies, or of the uncertainty in measuring mass with the balance. Although we often define spread relative to a specific measure of central tendency, its magnitude is independent of the central value. Changing all measurements in the same direction, by adding or subtracting a constant value, changes the mean or median, but does not change the spread. 
There are three common measures of spread. The range, the standard deviation, and the variance. Range. The range, W, is the difference between a data set's largest and smallest values. The range is equal to the x largest minus the x smallest. The range provides information about the total variability in the data set, but does not provide any information about the distribution of individual values. The range for the data in table 4.1 is W is equal to 3.198 minus 3.056 grams, which is equal to 0.142 grams. Standard deviation. The standard deviation, S, describes the spread of a data set as individual values about its mean and is given as S is equal to the square root of the sum of X sub I minus the mean squared divided by N minus 1 where x sub i is one of n individual values in the data set, and x bar is the data set's mean value. Frequently, the relative standard deviation, SR, is reported. The relative standard deviation is equal to the standard deviation over the mean. The percent relative standard deviation is relative standard deviation times 100. Variance. Another common measure of spread is the square of the standard deviation, or the variance. We usually report a data set as standard deviation, rather than its variance, because the mean value and the standard deviation have the same unit. As we will see shortly, the variance is a useful measure of spread, because its values are additive.